Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Oxhorn, and this video is the full story to Vault-Tec Among the Stars. Vault-Tec Among the Stars is a new dungeon that appears with the Nuka World DLC. The Nuka Cola Company had relationships with many people in the military, and those relationships extended to the Vault-Tec Corporation as well. Vault-Tec Among the Stars is less of an amusement ride and more of a sci-fi experience. It reminded me a lot of the real-world Epcot Center in Walt Disney World, which is dedicated to celebrating human achievement and talking about technological innovation. This vault Tech Among the Stars experience is trying to predict what vault life would be like in space and on other worlds. More practically, it served as a sales initiative by the vault Tech company. Sales representatives were on site to try and sell a vault space to people who finished the attraction. We learned this in the sales terminal that you find in the lobby. The terminal includes a lot of entries on instructions to salespeople on how to land the sale. It really gets into micromanaging. It talks about how the sales individual should offer them a snack or get them something to drink. It even tells them that they should use a pleasant compliment. Maybe start with a joke, as long as it's a clean joke. It says that if the patron still seems hesitant, that you could try and casually refer them to magazines that talk about radiation burns and how horrible they are, or how nuclear material can cause mutation. If the sales rep is successful, they then have to give the purchaser a bunch of forms, and the names of these are hilarious. One is a health form, a liability waiver, the last will and testament form, the vault Tech citizenship agreement, the organ donation invoice, psychological evaluation screening, the intimate relations conduct agreement? Really? The rights revocation charter and a simple family history form. Looks like to live in a vault meant that you were gambling away a lot of your own personal freedoms and dignity. As you go through the attraction, you're attacked by a lot of the pre-war robots that are still active on site. It can get pretty tricky at lower levels, especially with the ceiling-mounted laser turrets. Those things are killer. One of the strange things you notice upon entering the mock vault is that the screen goes blurry and you hear a buzzing sound in your ears. The blurry sensation lasts for a long time, and it can interfere with combat, so it's best to sneak in slowly so that the blur effect is gone before you actually engage in combat. Otherwise, you don't know what you're aiming at. This isn't a real vault, it's a mock vault. You can tell because many of the sliding doors lead to solid concrete walls. This is simply intended to show the patron what it might be like to live in a vault on another world. This fake vault is on the world Arcturus Prime, a frontier colony in the year 2291, as the overhead narrator is good enough to tell us. Coming down from the atrium level, we enter a mock-up of what living quarters might look like in one of these space vaults. You're again blasted by this blurry sensation and the buzzing in your ears. After the battle ends, if you hold still and listen, you can actually hear murmuring in the background. It's really easy to miss, especially if you have the music turned on, and it's completely indiscernible. I tried speeding up and slowing down this background murmuring to see if it was words, but it's not, it just appears to be mumbled noises. Or they've been distorted so much that I couldn't tell what they were. When you go through a door in one of the fake bedrooms, you find the operations room. This is where the staff of the attraction managed the attraction. We find two corpses and a terminal called the Operations Terminal. This belonged to Jay Hodgson, and the terminal only includes his personal journal entries. We learn that Hodgson is a new hire, and he's really appreciative to have the job. But he can't help notice that there are strange things going on here. One day an old man collapsed while walking through the exhibit. Dr. Bateman said it must have been heat stroke, but Hodgson noticed that it's only 72 degrees in here. Hodgson records that Dr. Bateman looks progressively more antsy each day. 
He's also becoming more forgetful. He forgets his keys, and he helpfully mentions that Bateman keeps a spare key in his locker, which you can go pick up. Hodgson starts to complain about headaches and random nosebleeds. In a later journal entry, he says that he doesn't even remember making some of the previous journal entries. And then he notes that Dr. Bateman told him to lay off the whiskey, but he doesn't remember drinking whiskey even though he smells whiskey on his own breath. He records some lady running out of the exhibit screaming, another guy stripping off all of his clothes. What is going on here? Well, if you go through a side door, you find the key that Hodgson mentioned in his terminal. If you keep exploring down this path, it leads you to the ground floor of the atrium where apparently they were growing large trees and plants to make it feel like a park that you would find at Earth. You have to fight through a lot of terminals on robots to get there, but it's a dead end. Well, if you go back through the fake bedroom to the living quarters, you can go through the door labeled hydroponics. This leads you through hydroponics and what appears to be a chemistry station. Here's another tough fight with robots. But what's interesting about this is we find a green mist being sprayed. But it's not being sprayed on the plants like you would think. It's actually pointed outward towards the walkway. This is the path that the exhibit patrons would be walking down. So apparently this exhibit would be spraying the exhibit goers with some sort of green liquid. If you round the circle back to the fake living quarters, you find a locked door. You can use the key that you found in the locker to open it. And here we find a key to the observation room, the project lead terminal, and a personal log by Louis Bateman. This is Louis Bateman reporting on week two of project consumer guidance. Civilian employees are starting to experience extreme headaches similar to the previous study. Luckily, the associated depression has not surfaced, so suicides aren't expected to be an issue yet. The increase in subliminal messaging frequency continues to have little to no effect on many visitors. But the speed at which the park staff was affected does show that some level of success has been achieved. I recommend moving forward with the audio tours for the next project. Perhaps a higher frequency of messaging fed directly into a consumer who can focus will be more effective. It appears that Lewis Bateman was the project lead and we now understand a little bit more about what's going on. vault -Tec was using this attraction to experiment on exhibit goers. And not only that, but to experiment on their own employees. When you take a look at the project lead terminal, we learn a little bit more about what each of these experiments did. Experiment one was brainwave disruption. It used radiation scrubbers to emit an electromagnetic field that caused interference with human brainwave patterns. They expected the results of that experiment would be loss of motor control, temporary stupor, and forgetfulness. This was the blurred vision that we got when we first entered the vault. That was the brainwave disruption experiment that's been going on for over 200 years. This experiment also explains why Hodgman talks about memory loss. Experiment number two was subliminal suggestions. They used an audio emitter throughout the exhibit generating subliminal suggestions overlaid on a specific frequency. This caused some of the exhibit goers to perform involuntary actions and it caused headaches and depression. We just heard in his audio tape that it even caused suicides. That was the strange sort of metallic murmuring that we heard when we stopped to listen. The third experiment was hypnotic pheromones. This experiment released an airborne toxin using those sprayers with that green mist made from genetically modified flora. This experiment actually got people addicted to the pheromones and made them more susceptible to suggestion, meaning that they were much more likely to buy a space in one of the vaults. The fourth experiment was theta radiation, which used the modified reactor that you find here in the vault to emit radiation in low short doses. Apparently the results for that were drowsiness, fatigue, and sleep deprivation, which led to paranoia. And the fifth experiment was long-term testing on all of the staff that worked there, including Hodgson, Grunner, Dallas, Bartleby, and Langston. The skeleton in this room must be that of Bateman. He must have died in the vault after the bombs fell. 
Now that you have the key to the observation room, you can go back to the operations room and unlock the door. In this room, we find two skeletons, one of which has a 10 millimeter pistol in his hand. There are two terminals in this room. The first recounts the daily observations of Experiment 02. Remember, this is the one that gave subliminal messages to the people who attended the exhibit. The observer at this terminal was Langston. We learned that vault was experimenting on a variety of different strength holotapes, the weakest of which was the blue strength holotape. This had simple suggestions like blink your eyes, scratch your nose, take off your hat. Langston notes that this one is not very effective. The next level of holotape is the orange grade holotape. This one works much better, and Dr. Bateman says that it has to do with this holotape taking advantage of a human's fight or flight response, which causes an endorphin release in the body, which makes it addicting. In the next entry, we learn the kind of things that are said in the orange holotape. They include violence, like shove the person in front of you. Langston records that a fist fight actually broke out when that was used, which caused them to go back to the blue tape for a while. It's here that we learn that they even have red grade holotapes, but Langston Langston is too scared to even use that one. In the last observation, we learned that Langston got a guy to drink someone else's Nuka-Cola, made a lady steal a wallet from another guy's pocket, and then caused a third guy to urinate in his own pants. So apparently, the subliminal messaging worked very well. The next terminal records observations from Experiment 4. Remember, Experiment 4 was dosing visitors with radiation when they visited the fake reactor room. Now, what we learned in the very first entry is that the employee assigned to this terminal, Grunner, was actually instructed to work on the fake reactor personally. He climbed up into it to change out the core dampener himself, which of course exposed him to that theta radiation. Apparently the experiment is working, he's noticing that people are getting tired, getting a bit dizzy, exhibiting slurred speech, but that's about it, it's not a really interesting experiment. And Grunner complains in the next entry that he just finds himself staring at a screen all day, every day. Nothing else really changes. But he starts to put two and two together in the next entry, where he finally gets the idea that maybe he is part of the experiment. Of course, they don't have anything interesting for him to do. His job is to sit in front of that monitor to get exposed to theta radiation so that they can record what happens. Grunner finally has enough of it. He locks himself in the observation room with a 10 millimeter pistol and he starts to go mad, possibly due to so much radiation exposure. But when Langston, the guy who was observing the effects of the holotapes, entered the room the day the bombs fell, Grunner shot him. He then complains, his head is dizzy, he keeps falling asleep, he's getting headaches, he doesn't know what the truth is anymore, and he ends by saying, I now know what I have to do. We can assume that he then turned the gun on himself and killed himself. We don't find any terminals telling us the outcomes of experiments one and three. They did not include an observation room for Dallas and Bartleby who were observing experiments one and three. But I think the personal entries by the employees tell us the outcomes of experiment five, the long-term testing of the vault tech above the stars employees themselves. As with many of the experiments that vault Tech has been known to do, we don't really know their reasons. Why did they want to know what Theta radiation did to people? Some of the others make more sense. Making someone more suggestible to buying a room in a vault, for example. Making vault dwellers easier to control using subliminal messaging. But ultimately, with vault Tech Among the Stars, we find the ruin of yet another example of vault Tech pre-war inhumanity. Valtech is an excellent example of science run amok, where humans are only as useful as the experiments they are part of. Where a human being is no more valuable than a lab rat. I think the Institute could learn some lessons from the fate of Valtech. Well, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you liked this video. This is part of research I am doing into the vault Tech company in preparation for a much larger video. I hope you enjoyed this video on Nuka World lore. I've done a few so far, and I do plan to go through the entire DLC and make lore videos like this 
on everything. So please subscribe for more Fallout 4 and Danuka World content. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. Patreon subscribers gain access to my private Discord server, as well as a bunch of other cool Oxhorn perks. But more than anything, ladies and gentlemen, I am just so glad that you're here watching this video. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow morning bright and early with a brand new video.